Hello. This is the ITF 108 Web Trans Working Group meeting. The Jabber room is webtrans at jabber.itf.org. If you can hear me, it's likely that you're in Meet Echo. few things about the meeting. There is actually documentation on the use of Meet Echo at ITF 108 at the link above. This session is being recorded. You need ITF registration and a data tracker account to join the meeting. You don't need to do anything to sign the blue sheets. It happens automatically. Please uh, join the Jabber room via the data tracker meeting agenda. When you enter the queue, you need to select whether you want to enable audio, video, or both. And then it's a separate step when you're called on to enable your audio. Uh, throughout the meeting so far, people have talked without realizing that they're not heard. Also, it is good for you to use headphones while speaking to eliminate any possibility of echo uh, and state your full name, which makes it easier to deal with in the minutes. This is the note well, a reminder of ITF policies in effect on various topics, such as patents and code of conduct. The details are set forth in BCP 79 and the other documents listed here. So please read them. As a reminder, by participating in ITF, you agree to follow the ITF processes and policies and any contribution covered by patents or patent applications uh, must be disclosed. And other things that are on the slide. Okay, a little bit about the meeting. Uh, we have an ether pad. Do we have a volunteer for Jabber Scribe? Or note takers? Uh, I think we need a, a volunteer for JavaScribe and note takers. Anyone? Remind folks that if we don't have anyone willing to help with this, we're not going to be able to have a session. Oh, Spencer's in the queue. Come on in, Spencer. I, was, I can do the Jabber Squad. Ah, thank you so much, Spencer. How about uh, an Ethernet, uh, Etherpad note taker? Yeah, the Etherpad is in this link, uh, Cody MD, so it's not really hard. 
uh, to do. You just have to take notes while people are speaking. Uh, Lucas, can, can I convince you to do that? Sorry, I'm really bad at note taking. Um, if somebody wants to help me, um, but. yeah, we can have more than one. It's it's a collaborative app, so two people can write in at once. Um, I can probably help out for a bit. Um. Awesome! Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And and for everyone else in the session, uh, please. Do feel free to take a look at the the notes and for example, and if you've said something, please check like how what you said was transcribed and feel free to make edits if it, if it's not correct. Thanks. Yeah, it's a collaborative editing app, so definitely easy to do that. Thank you. Okay, so here is the agenda. Uh, basically, David will be managing the speaking queue, um, and we're uh, we. We'll do the agenda bash. Uh, we'll have Will Law give us an update on the status of W3C, Web Transport Working Group, and then Will will talk about use cases. Then uh, Victor will go over the Web Transport Overview and Requirements. We'll have a presentation from Eric on HTTP2, and then the Victor will talk about Quick and HTTP3, and then we'll try to wrap things up. Um, one thing that people have been noticing in ITF 108 is Meet Echo will cut us off apparently to the minute once our session is done. So uh, we need to be conscious of time. That has been fixed. Oh, that's been session. fixed. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's good. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to turn it over to Will, which I think means that Will has to get into the queue and then enable the audio. Yeah, well, so Will should be able to speak right now, and then Oh, Will we should, should. Okay. okay. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. And then Bernard okay. will advance this. Okay. Yeah, I'll advance the slides for you. Right, so thank you very much, uh, Bernard and David, uh, for the invitation. I'm gonna give a short update on uh, advancements at W3C, and then I'm gonna go through a short section on the use cases as one of our first actions. So the work group charter within W3C has been published. The link is available on the slides here. The charter process is underway. Voting is taking place. We expect a decision in August. And then I've posted the rough timeline. First teleconference should start about September 20, and if all goes well, progress through to sometime in 2023 uh, with various intermediate stages. Our first order of action is a use case document. It's, it's been stated that there's been a lot of interest and uh, time spent in promoting web transport and its ideals over the last two years. Uh, but there hasn't been a coordinated use case document that has been sprung up in many cases. So we, we're going to initiate that. We hope it can form a foundation for both the W3C API activities and also the core transport development within IETF. Two co-chairs have been nominated in advance of the W, the working group establishment, Yanivar Brewery from Mozilla and myself, Will Law from Akamai. I realize I haven't been involved in IETF uh, activities previously, so I, I am new to this group. I have been involved in standards uh, within the Dash Industry Forum and with CTA Wave uh, and uh, in ancillary roles within W3C, so I'm excited to take on this position. Next slide, please. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you, Bernard. Right, let's get going. So I, what I'm citing here is, is a couple of uh, sources. So we we polled all the various presentations Applications and uh, web activities that we could find. I think many of you on the call, you're going to find that these are links to your your documents. Uh, we've collected these in a temporary home on a Google Doc, which is public and accessible there. This will be moved as soon as possible over to the WICG Web Transport GitHub. We'll issue a PR there, and then we can have a more structured curation and debate of these use cases. At the moment, uh, my, my goal is simply to collect them all, uh, and then we can start pruning the tree. 
Next slide, please. I'm going to go through some use cases here, and again, the order does not imply any priority. Priority. These are the order which have been listed in, in previous documents and in which we found them. So machine learning uh, is listed as a, as a single topic. I think primarily the use cases here relate to the I.O. between a cloud-based ML process and the clients. Uh, one of these cases is speech translation or emotion. You're sending real-time audio video from the client up to the cloud, and you want to analyze it very quickly with an ML component or an AI component, and then perhaps return translated audio or transcript uh, to the client down the same connection. Okay, uh, security camera analysis is another opportunity here. This is data and or video being sent to the cloud service uh, from many machines now, so not necessarily you know, human interface uh, devices. Uh, opportunity is also here for maybe not sending traditional video, but for security might only need to send motion vectors and edge detection to some sort of preliminary analysis on the client and then send a reduced data set up to the cloud. And that's been cited as a quick transport use case. I do want to say from the beginning, we want to separate use cases from requirements and requirements from solutions. So we'll come later to the fact as well, is this quick transport, is this H3 transport, or is this something else? I think first we should define the use cases from those extract requirements. What do we need to do? And then look at the technology set we have. And if we have to invent something new to do it well, then we shall do that. Multiplayer gaming, uh, both web and console based. So there's the gameplay instructions being sent from the client, wherever it may be, down to a coordination or gameplay server. These are very, there's a mixture actually of, of the data being sent. Some is very time sensitive, such that late data has no meaning, which would be location type data. Others are far more stateful. If you've selected a weapon or you have an avatar, uh, that information cannot be lost. So there's a mixture of data that can be lossy and, and that must be uh, non-lossy. And the data flow is also bi-directional. It's also a, this game flow that has to go to a coordinating server, but data that be, may be more efficient going directly to peers as well. And there's been case, use cases cited for AR gaming that require real world interaction. So you need a, a very low latency feedback of your real world environment intermixed with the gameplay. Virtual theater is a use case that falls within this, where you have actors in different geo separate locations with virtual backgrounds, but they are synchronized sufficiently well such that it appears to be coordinated uh, theatrical presentation. Next slide, please. So low latency live streaming, um, this is the one that's closest to my heart. I, I work at Akamai, I'm responsible for live streaming there. Uh, there's the un unidirectional broadcast case. This is one stream to a million people, traditional news, events, uh, wagering. The latency I've listed here is sub uh, one second. Uh, we've done this because there's traditional segmented media today. They can certainly be hitting the low seconds in terms of end-to-end -end latency. We do need to preempt social media on its, its delay. But what we need is quality that can support UHD resolutions, can support dynamic range, can support high frame rate, and can support DRM. That's not something that's available to us with WebRTC today. There's a use case around bi-directional, few-to-few video chats. Not quite what we have today. I would say this is few to many, but certainly the, the Zooms that are taking place across the country right now. If there was an opportunity for reduced contection time and complexity compared to what we have with WebRTC, FaceTime is a good example of, of few to few uh, connections. Again, the debate here, is this better satisfied by quick transport, H3 transport? Um, that, that is a subsequent decision as to whether we include this use case as one of our uh, goal-based use cases. Cloud game streaming here, the game is actually being rendered at the edge of the cloud. Google Stadia is a good example of this and transmitted to a much thinner client that's not having to do the heavy work rendering the game. The latency requirements here are some of the strictest amongst any of these use cases, certainly for video, a couple of uh, two frames or so of data or even less is, is preferred. There's the same bi-directional gameplay instructions here, server-based and perhaps P2P based. And, uh, this has been labeled as a quick transport use case as well. Next slide, please. 
So server-based video conferencing, this is exactly what we're taking place uh, with right now. Obviously, traditionally uh, satisfied via WebRTC, but there's requirements around simpler session establishment. If you know you're talking to a server, you don't have to go to the full NAT traversal and uh, connection overhead that WebRTC is designed to provide. Also requirements around censorship circumvention, uh, not leaking as much personal information during a session establishment that perhaps WebRTC leaks today. And the question will be whether this is quick transport or H3 transport. Bernard, I know you added these, these line items. Did you want to actually have a debate on these right now or is that that for further debate? Because I think that's, these could each be 20 minute debate points on their own. Yeah, probably not time right now, but it, it will come up later. So okay. um, maybe okay. we can go back to the slides if, if people want to talk about these things. Certainly. I'll, I'll progress without a, a discussion because I do want to have a long one on each of these. Uh, remote desktop, another submitted use case. Uh, there are, in all of these, there's technologies we can do these today, but perhaps we can have technologies where we do these better. So that's transmission of screen sharing, uh, collaborative work on, ski, on screen, scaling out to large audiences, uh, online document sharing, online document editing, synchronized mass movement, and remote control and assistance with IT support taking over a system. It's a step beyond video conferencing uh, with far more interaction with hey, local applications than you might have with a web conference based system. But it bears a lot of the same parallels. Also client to server in a mixture of P2P and is being promoted as a quick transport use case in, uh, in this use case document. Next slide, please. Time synchronized multimedia, this is an interesting one. This is the ability to have people singing or playing musical instruments together when they're physically separate, but the, with the, the, day, the audio and video precisely aligned enough such that it would be a pleasant singing or musical experience. If, if your kids have tried to do this at school for choir or, or music practice, you realize even with WebRTC, we're, we're woefully inadequate with any, any sort of time sync there today. So a, a, a fundamental layer for accurately syncing the video, still with very low latency and audio. IoT sensor and data analytics transfer. This is all about the efficient and intermittent, perhaps, transmission of data. For example, if a very low power device wants to send a, a one-bit a one flag, uh, with H3 today, there's a lot of overhead uh, that has to be done simply to carry that one bit of information. Uh, so GPS updates, mouse clickers on sites are specific examples in that role. So we might want to send a little bit of data. Some of it may be lossy, some of it uh, not. Sensor data upload may include filters, aggregation triggers on, on, on the data as it's uh, being transmitted either on the client or up to the server. And then pub sub models. So they're, they're in, in work today. We use long polling, other techniques for doing them, but could, could they be done more efficiently? These would drive social feeds like Twitter at, at extreme scale, financial tickers, messaging platforms, uh, and chat platforms that are being built today. And this is perhaps better served up front by an H3 transport use case. Next slide, please. So, and this is this is my last section here. So I, I think there's some interesting uh, issues to be addressed. Can these tech, can these use cases here be solved sufficiently well using existing technologies? We certainly can engineer solutions to them today. Could they be solved to an improved degree by extending existing technologies? WebSocket and WebRTC being the obvious candidates here. And then if, if the answers are no to these prior then does this warrant the development of a new technology and then should that new technology be quick transport, H3 transport or another transport? And we don't have time uh, in this call today to debate these, but these are the questions that needs to be asked. The other very important question up front is who creates the goals and non-goals between IETF and W3C? We certainly require coordination, uh, but if W3C is hoping for a API development in a certain line that IETF is not developing or the reverse IETF develops a, a capability that is not intended to be utilized by W3C, then cross coordination. So we, we do need to think about pruning some of these use cases. And 
The encouragement here is my personal one. I would hope that web transport can do a few things really, really well versus attempt to satisfy perhaps every use case that, that I've just listed uh, in, in the interests of it being an, an efficient new development. Uh, we should try to constrain it. And I did want to extend my wishes for fruitful collaboration. I will be reaching out through Bernard uh, to this group. I will be inviting this group to participate and we can address the issues that I have on this slide here. And I, and I hope we can do so openly and efficiently. So thank you, Bernard, and back to you. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, David, is there anyone in the queue or can we move on? I think Lucas just entered the queue. Okay. This is in the queue. Let's go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, go ahead. Cool. Just uh, thanks for the presentation, Will. Um, just a point, um, uh, a comment, sorry, on your your last point there about collaboration with the ITF and W3C. Yeah. Um, like some of them, like me, uh, I am familiar with with both groups, but tend to, to stick to the ITF work a bit more than others. Um, how? What's what's a good way of, of keeping track of this work in W3C? So the obvious one is that we have people rep in active in both uh, forums within IETF and three c so that would be ideal. But we also want a, 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 a more formal and structured update process. If people miss meetings, there still needs to be a way. So my plan was uh, to talk with Bernard about this and maybe as, as part of our each, I don't know what our meeting cadence and frequency would be, but I would hope that as certainly a part of each meeting that I intend to run within W3C, I would like to do an IETF update. And if, if there's there's matters that we need to discuss between the two groups, we can either invite representatives to the other group's meeting or schedule an ad hoc meeting that we those interested parties can then join. But I, I, I'm hoping for something like regular and scheduled, and my plan is to hammer that out with Bernard and David. Cool, thanks. Um, I think if, if those kinds of um, things come back to the mailing list, that would really help, even if there's maybe a bit of duplication across people who follow both things. Um, it, it would definitely help me at least avoid missing things. Certainly. I don't want to contribute to more <laughs> large groups' uh, email overload, but we, I will try to find the most efficient one. And again, I realize I'm a neophyte at, at IETF, so I will try to seek out the best channels to, to communicate to these groups. Additional questions? And people may also be wanting to raise their hand saying, hey, my use case is not there. I have a different one. So there will be opportunity for that. We're not closing that use case document. I will, through the mailing list and through to this group, uh, put out the link to the document online, and you'll be able to uh, file a GitHub issue and add your use case to that. OK, I hear no more questions, Bernard. Thank you. OK, thank you. All right, so uh, Victor, you are up. Victor. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Cool. <laughs> OK, excellent. Uh, hello, I'm Victor Vasiliev, Google. Uh, I'm the editor for the Web Transport Overview and Requirements Draft, uh, also known as Web Transport Model Document. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as a reminder, the purpose of this document is uh, to establish the bridge between W3C and uh, IETF and kind of formulate in general what web transport is and what we expect the protocols uh, that IETF develops to provide so that W3C can build API on top of those protocols. Uh, so that's the summary and next slide. Uh, so the main update is that this draft was adopted by the working group. Uh, there is a GitHub repository which has issues. Uh, I encourage everyone to take a look at that repository. Uh, it currently has uh, three issues, which are mostly me 
going through all the issues I filed on the uh, that we had on the WACG draft and moving them over to ITF because I believe they're more appropriate here. Uh, and uh, I'll go over those issues, but the important thing is uh, uh, everyone is encouraged to look at take a look at those issues and comment and file new issues if they find them in the overview draft. Next slide. So I will give overview of the issues. The first issue we have that's open is the issue of stream identifiers. So as you might know, all of our protocols have to provide streams, which are reliable and bidirectional and or unidirectional. And uh, there is some text in the draft which basically says that stream ID is an opaque 64-bit blob, uh, and we do not assume any structure, mostly because the initial idea was that, well, we don't want to copy the quick structure because quick has very specific structure, and uh, it's unclear if it would map to our TCP fallback, and we would not want to uh, us to over-constrain ourselves. So, Next slide. So uh, the story with stream IDs is that they were in the very original API draft. And then in Chrome implementation of quick transport, and I think in the current revision of the API draft, we removed those. And there are two reasons why we removed those and why this is a hard issue. The first one is if we have stream IDs, we need to decide how the stream IDs interact with proxying. Uh, for instance, one problem is that if two streams arrive at a like reverse proxy in a particular order, uh, uh, like let's say first stream three is on stream one, then it is quite possible that the proxy will open stream three first because it doesn't know what stream one is and whether it belongs to web transport or to something else, and then it will have to open stream one. But this way, the actual endpoints, the actual client and the actual server do not have consistent view. And this is one of the problems we would have to deal with if we decide to expose stream IDs to the application. Uh, the second one is that, well, if it's HTTP free transport and we're multiplexing multiple transport to one point. There is no one-to-one -one stream ID correspondence. And this other problem, which is not related to proxying, is that if you have a pooled transport to your stream IDs, you can't use the exact stream IDs you have because that might expose some information about what else is going on on that connection. And that connection might have unrelated traffic. Uh, next slide. So, or, as I said, we originally removed that, but uh, people, web developers, actually came to GitHub of the APIs back, and they asked to add it back. And the reason is uh, uh, a lot of them care to uh, know exactly in which order the streams have arrived, and that's because they use that ordering in order to uh, for instance, if it's a video stream to order frames. Uh, and this is actually interesting because this makes our current definition in the draft useless, even with, uh, even with like what's there, because we do not actually require stream IDs to be ordered. And in fact, uh, that ordering is like very weird if you just copy quick IDs as is. Uh, so that's the first issue. The second issue, next slide, uh, is uh, we have no consistent stream reset semantics. Uh, and namely, if we will try to unify semantics across something like Quick and something like HTTP2, they have different semantics because in Quick, you can reset, you can reset the right half and you can ask peer to reset its right half, but you can't like actually close both half of the stream yourself, whereas this is how TCP works and this is how HTTP2 stream machine works. Uh, and 
we have two options in either way. One option is uh, we just make everything like HTTP2 because that's the lowest common denominator, or we somehow extend the web transport over HTTP2 draft to introduce a mechanism like stop sending, uh, which sounds like a lot of complexity. Next slide. Uh, the final issue is there is some ambiguity. So we define web transport in terms of streams of bytes because streams of bytes is a, a primitive which is uh, all of our transports are based off. Uh, that's uh, both HTTP2, HTTP3, quick, etc. cetera. Uh, they're all based on streams of bytes. And all the previous APIs that deal to a similar problem on the web used uh, finite size messages. And it was streams of finite size messages. So WebSocket and RTC data channels use those. And there are some questions about whether we want to do anything to address it. Uh, currently in the draft, we call out that such things exist, but they're outside of scope of web transport currently. Uh, there are some interesting, uh, it is quite possible that doing that uh, uh, will introduce complexity both like in terms of adding things, adding entities to the protocol, uh, and in terms of uh, just designing API for messages such that messages actually have uh, variable size and you can send large messages is hard. And for what it's worth, uh, neither WebSocket nor our DC data channel really do that, even though often on paper they claim to support that. Uh, uh, that's uh, it. Next slide. So that, uh, there are some other missing pieces in the drafts that I need to fill in, and people are welcome to send pull requests. The first one is uh, we don't we define streams and we define operation on streams, but we've not actually spelled out the state machine, and we should spell it out just to give idea and like it would be important for a reference when we define API. And the second point is that there are like to do in multiple sections and the biggest one is that there is a question of what do we do with priorities. And I don't I think I don't think we're at the point where we're quite ready to address that because we have more pressing matters. But uh, that's a summary of all open issues currently. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's basically all interesting, important issues that I filed based on what has came during the API discussion. Uh, people are welcome to ask more. I want to know, since we have time, whether people have comments on those three issues presented. David, is anyone in the queue? Uh, Victor, I have a comment on the state machine issue. I think it is important to get clarity on the state machine. Uh, at various points in the API doc, we actually did have a state machine uh, figure, but as we added transports, it became more and more complicated. <laughs> And as Quick evolved, we had to change the state machine. So it's definitely something that people will want to understand and make sure uh, it is correct. There are actually like two state machines. There is the one for entire transport, and then there is one for stream. Right. And the one for transport is interesting because we might want to extend it in the future if we add uh, web RT if, I'm sorry, if we add uh, zero RTT support. Hmm. Uh, uh, oh, sir, is it uh, David? Uh, I think there are people in the queue. 
Ben was in the queue, was having issues. So let, let's roll through the queue, and Ben, I see you're at the end. So hopefully it works by then. All right, Yutaka. Hi, I'm uh, Yutaka Hirano. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, thank you. Regarding the message and the bytes, WebSocket allows infinite size messages, and uh, that prevent us from some op optimization. So that I would, I don't want to have that uh, messaging schema. Uh, I agree. I like my personal position on issue number three is that since none of our protocols support messaging, we should just stick with streams. Uh, and uh, after we stick with streams, we uh, uh, and like if applications want message deliminations, they can do it themselves. It's not that hard. Thank you. Is there someone else in the queue? Yeah, I mean, uh, Harold is in, was uh, was in the queue, and now speaking. Uh, messaging, okay. you know what will happen if you d don't define messages? That will mean that we'll use streams as messages. <laughs> uh, that is one of supported modes of operating quick. Yeah, it's on. It's reliable and unordered, though. So the, the key distinction there, just jumping in, this is David, um, is the, the, the property that folks often want with messages is reliable and in order. And so that requires putting multiple separate messages on a given stream to benefit from that stream ordering. And it's possible for the application layer to do this. And then the, the question for the working group is, is this a feature that we want to build into web transport or do we leave this, we just provide stream and leave the framing inside those stream as an exercise to the application? Both are feasible. So uh, one, uh, one of the, uh, I think that uh, the focus on bytes is uh, harmful because uh, it uh, means that you do a lot of stuff that like retransmitting, trans, retransmitting buffers that covers uh, part, parts of multiple messages uh, that uh, are not optimal. So I'd rather have uh, messages in the protocol. Eric Nigro and Akamai, um, on issue three, I also think that having messages gives more flexibility for um, applications to be able to do things like handle um, saying this is a unit that I'm okay being lost as a unit or or if we want to apply additional additional semantics on that later being able to say things like like I would prefer these not be sent in the same underlying packet so that if you build a um, something um, using FEC on top of this that you have a little more control over which which um, sets of um, messages get um, are more or less likely to get lost relative to others? Uh, would uh, datagram satisfy that problem? I'm sorry, address that problem. Model would would I guess a datagram model would solve would would address that. So streams are in addition to datagrams. When we're talking about messages, we're specifically talking about messages that are A, reliable, and B, span multiple packets. So that means if you are willing to use datagrams, you can use datagram, datagrams and like deal with all of those issues yourselves. And we can imagine adding such low level control as like anti-affinity of packets there. Uh, but like trying to build it with messages as a higher, as, which is a higher level concept seems like uh, it's a lot of effort and it's unclear whether it's beneficial because I suspect most people who want that kind of control would try to beat and build on top of datagrams themselves. No, that's a good, that's a good point. It's unclear what, what value you get from both.
before I add the next person, um, please, everyone, even if I introduce you, just every time you speak after someone else, please restate your name. Meet Echo is missing a very important feature, which is to visually show who's talking. And this is making it very hard for our scribes and minute takers. So please, every time you start talking, just start with your name. Thank you. Next up, Ben Schwartz. Uh, oh. Uh, we hear you. Hello. I am Squish. Even <laughs> OK. Uh, I'll deal with that later. Uh, I. OK. I, I just wanted to point out, I guess, one really silly thing, which is that the WebSocket specification and protocol have um, a bunch of other stuff in them like the concept of binary versus text frames uh, or messages. So uh, it's not enough to just create some kind of, of a sequential message delivery system and call it a, a WebSocket replacement uh, if you really want a full drop-in replacement. Uh, this is, I, I don't have a a clear answer for where this all ought to go. Um, I just, uh, I'll just remind everybody that the HTTP2 WebSocket draft, which has not really widely been implemented, but has some implementation, uh, is uh, also naturally applies to HTTP3. Um, and it continues to give you the in order behavior. Um, so I guess personally, what I would like is, uh, you know, let's let's develop the cleanest protocol we can think of, and let's try more on the W3C side to find an API specification that allows uh, current WebSocket users to easily upgrade. Uh, thank you for pointing out the text versus binary message distinction. I completely forgot about that, but yeah, that's one of the things that would probably prevent that like idea of WebSocket web transport being like uh, fit fitting one into another. Um, from the uh, discussion we had when chartering, um, being a drop-in replacement for WebSocket isn't currently a requirement for web transport. We can make it that if we wanted to, but, and then this is my, you know, two cents, like that's not absolutely necessary. We're not gonna drop support for WebSocket in browsers anytime soon. So like having people still use WebSocket is an option. All right, uh, next uh, up, oh, just, sorry, just, go ahead. One, just one comment on that, David. I think also you have to be clear about what you're trying to be compatible with. Are you trying to be compatible with the WebSockets API? because it's possible to build, for example, and, and this was actually done, I think Peter Thatcher did a, a sample, was to build a, a shim of the WebSockets API, like a message API on top of web transport. Uh, so I, I just think if we wanna do it, we have to be really clear about what exactly the requirement is. Okay, so are we moving on to Eric's presentation? Uh, there are still two people in the queue, but... Uh, uh, still two people in the queue, okay. All right. uh, thanks, uh, Ian Sweat. Uh, I guess I wanted to say that um, the, the idea of messages is is interesting, but it, from this conversation, it seems like maybe there's a few different set of sets of use cases. Some people who care about the transmission order of the messages and an effort to reorder them when they arrive, and other people who actually might want head of line blocking. Um, and I guess putting a message kind of substrate on top of a stream uh, does provide head of line blocking, but it does not actually make it that easy to uh, do out of order delivery because uh, it's difficult to figure out exactly where the frame boundaries are. So I, I think having a clear idea of what the requirements are, whether it's really like we want in, in order delivery or do we want uh, just to know what the transmission order originally was would be helpful. Um, oh, and yeah, that's it. Next up, Jana. Angar. 
Hi, Jana Iyengar. I actually, Ian said mostly what I wanted to say, which is that I think you can, uh, I'll add to it just a bit, that uh, streams, uh, sh I, I would recommend uh, uh, thinking about streams as very lightweight things. And if you want to think about them as messages, that's fine. It doesn't have to spend multiple packets is what I would say. It, you can have it in such a way that you can have, a, 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 it's basically two bits you need, a begin and an end bit for a stream effectively. And if you uh, have those as part of the message that you're sending, it can all fit within a packet um, if designed to be that lightweight. So if you can design web transport streams to be lightweight, broadly speaking, it would help, it would give you more flexibility in terms of how you can use it, even for message abstractions going forward. Um, I have one other comment on the uh, mapping streams to quick and yeah, that's the, the, the first set of issues saying streams are hard. Yeah, that's going to be difficult. I don't know what else to say at the moment for that, but that's, that 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 is going to be a difficult thing to accomplish across these different protocols. Um, all right, Bernard. Next next item. Okay, Eric. All right, Eric, you okay. should be good to go. I believe I am sending audio. Can you hear me? We can. Loud, well, Sweet. loud and clear, and slightly clipped, but yes. Yay, such fun. All right, uh, next slide, please. So uh, since we chatted last time, uh, we got some really good feedback from a lot of people. So thank you to everybody who had really good comments and contributed there. We've moved a bunch of those to GitHub issues. And if you go through the PDF of these slides, that link may or may not work, um, but we can drop it in the minutes. Um, and we updated to a, a one draft with not too, too many changes. Next slide, please. The I wanted to split talking about this into two separate sections. So we've got one section, which is a little bit of uh, concepts and fitting in very nicely with the previous conversation. Uh, that Victor was just prompting. And then the second part is a couple of actual issues uh, with specific questions that we'd really like some feedback on and to get some, some answers on. Uh, so starting with concepts, um, H2 transport gives you bidirectional streams over H2 with the added benefit that either endpoint can initiate a new stream similar to how Quick does today. Um, and it builds that over HTTP in a way that can traverse intermediaries but notably only ones that support web transport. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because we've had a lot of discussion around coexistence with existing HTTP traffic. And do we wanna make sure that we can run a web transport session uh, side by side with regular HTTP traffic? Do we wanna be able to run web transport sessions side by side with other web transport sessions? Um, and so part of being able to support that full uh, kind of feature set that we think we're getting from web transport alongside HTTP means uh, bringing back some of the capability that we have in H3 to H2. Next slide, please. As part of that, we're still missing a couple of things. One of those is unidirectional streams, which we've kind of waved off as, oh, that's easy. You just don't use one part of a bidirectional stream, uh, but we need to actually formalize how we do that. Um, and then datagrams and especially unreliability, which uh, the overview and requirements document uh, gives a really nice treatment of, hey, there are things that you might want and you know, in H3 mode and, and in some modes you may have them, in other modes you, know, you should do your best not to retransmit lost datagrams, but recognize that if you're going over TCP or something like that, once you've stuck it in the pipe, you may have no choice, it's gonna get there eventually. Um, as part of that, we have two things we need to think about. One of them is how do we uh, actually implement it? Do we do each message as a stream? Do we want out of order? Uh, Ian's comment earlier was, was spot on. I think we really need to clarify how much do we care about ordering? You're gonna, by definition, get some head of line blocking when you're going over H2, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And then the other half of that is how do we expose that to the user? Uh, there's, there's clearly what do we do to implement it? And then there's also how does this get expressed in the API? And, and that's something that, that comes up in, in the proposal for the API, especially around W3C. So I would second a lot of the conversations of let's make sure we bring that together so everybody's talking to everybody. Next slide, please. As a brief aside, um, and I put this in here to, to potentially spark some conversation later, uh, we need to decide if we want to have a quick equivalent over TCP that doesn't have H2. Um, and another way of saying that is quick splits out the multiplexing, multi-streaming transport bits that H2 provides from the HTTP bits on top, which are now provided by HTTP3, is distinct from quick. H3 being a mapping of quick onto the HTTP3 uh, interface that people want to use. And so as we talk about web transport over HTTP2 being a fallback to TCP from HTTP3, a lot of what we're doing is bringing back some of the features that we get from Quick or H3 uh, to HTTP2 and exposing it to people. And so at, at, on a larger scope, not necessarily even just within web transport, we need to figure out, do we want to have something that's sitting there on top of TCP that provides a lot of what Quick gives you? Or do you give a thing over H2 that gives you much the same as the kind of bottom half of H2, which is now quick in, in H3 land, um, and do that. Next slide, please. So those are a couple of the larger questions of, you know, what do we want to, where do we want to go? What do we need to think about? Let's set the stage for things. These are very specific GitHub issues. Um, most of them are coming from something that we've been talking about already. So I put in the quote from the, the original web transport overview that says these are what it needs to look like. Um, and so that's where we need to figure out where things go. So for this one, um, issue number three is we want to be able to have new streams without additional round trips. Um, that's actually brought up as one of the downsides of WebSocket is we don't necessarily want to do a handshake every time, at least if we're not allowed to send data before we do that handshake. Um, in H2, we have this concept of the connect stream that does the establishment of what is effectively a routing stream, and then the web transport stream, which is the thing on which you actually send data. And that's kind of nice, because if you're trying to do very lightweight streams where a stream is a message, you can associate each of those lightweight streams with your routing stream, and they all get the right place, and there's a little bit of shared lifetime that you don't lose, but you can potentially have them show up out of order if you're going across multiple hops, and those hops reorder them. Um, that being said, when we start talking about having multiple hops, you end up with a really interesting uh, distinction, which is that web transport likely needs to be available across each hop all the way there because that's what you're going to negotiate. Um, but that may not necessarily be web transport over HTTP2. And so I think it, it becomes important for us to think about whether we want to make sure that the well, there are ways in which, you know, web transport over HTTP2 is over TCP and therefore doesn't offer certain unreliability things. Uh, we likely need to have the corresponding section, uh, which already exists in, in most part, um, of what do we actually require from each thing so that we can make sure that we have this equivalent for each mapping of web transport onto the different H1, H2, H3, however that wants to go. Um, so I think the, the biggest question to answer here is uh, how do we want to, do we want to do anything special to specify how you can do very lightweight, you know, messages as streams so that you can bring them up really quickly? Next slide, please. So this is a fun one, um, unidirectional streams. So we know we need to be able to provide datagrams, unidirectional and bidirectional streams such that we can do much of what I was just talking about, where we make sure that regardless of mapping, you have enough of the features you want available uh, to be able to make some forwards progress on what you're doing. This has a very uh, pretty much A, B choice, it seems like so far. The, the proposals are either uh, open up H2 streams and actually half close them such that H2 in its state machine believes that the streams are effectively unidirectional at this point, 
or do we decide that that comes with some other connotations and has other meaning inside of H2 that we don't yet want about the stream lifetime? And so on top of that, we would have web transport simply say, you know, no, you said that this was a unidirectional stream. So we're just going to say you must not send data in the other direction and, you know, we'll freak out if you do. Um, so that's a layering question of where do we want to enforce this and, and how much do we believe that a unidirectional stream and a half closed stream are really the same thing. And one of the things that came up on the mailing list recently was that doing all of this over HTTP and HTTP3 transport versus doing this over quick and quick transport, um, which is the conversation we're about to have a little bit later in this session, uh, some of that was talking about what are the actual pieces of metadata that you are, we say, oh, HTTP is nice because it gives you some happy metadata and you can have this additional negotiation or carry additional things. Um, if you brought that back to quick and wanted to do it just on top of raw quick, uh, there, were, there were some opposing sides of, oh, well, you don't really need to bring that much back versus, oh, but we don't know what yet we're going to need. This is another case where we have a need for slightly additional metadata over what we had before to carry the type of stream that we'd want to have. And so as we bring that in, do we look forwards to having more and more and more of those? And does that impact our choice over whether we do this over HTTP or just over raw quick? Next slide, please. Datagrams, fun. Um, we've already got text in the overview that says you don't necessarily have to retransmit datagrams, but you might because you might have to, because you might have no choice. Uh, one of those things is we need to have the API such the application knows what they requested versus what they have. That's great. The other question becomes implementation wise, how do we actually do this? Do we want to have a dedicated datagram stream? Um, Alan brought up most of these options and I, th I think they're really good. So I thought it was worth talking about this here. Do we want to have a dedicated datagram stream where you say, hey, all of my datagrams are going to go on this stream that enforces ordering? Do you want to have it be a new frame that you actually introduce to H2 and therefore can treat a little bit more specially about the ordering in which you do things? Or do you want to send WT headers, which is effectively, do you want to open a new stream per datagram and do that lightweight stream as message, which is the discussion that we were just having. Um, so there's a whole spectrum here. A lot of that really does come back to what Ian said about we need to figure out what our requirements are. Do we really care about the ordering? Do we want to support it being delivered out of order? How much overhead do we think we get from each new stream as a message? And is that similarly cheap in H2 as it is in H3? I know Jono was saying it's not super expensive to do that and you can fit it all in one packet. We need to make sure that that's also true for H2. In general, it seems like it is, but there's a little bit more uh, to, to think about there. Next slide. Part two of datagrams, flow control. So this gets to be a little bit more interesting. Uh, I made a note here that having it be a new frame to carry datagrams makes it a little bit easier to reason about because you don't have to necessarily shoehorn yourself into an existing treatment of how streams contribute to flow control in H2 or not. But we need to make sure that the interactions that these datagrams have with other streams potentially allows the receiver to inhibit the ability of datagrams to fully consume every flight of data if you exempt them from flow control because you obviously don't want them to starve everything else out. That also introduces the interesting uh, caveat, which is if you say datagrams aren't part of flow control because when the receiver at the other end gets them, if you know, they're backed up and they'd like to exert back pressure. There isn't really back pressure for datagrams, so they can just drop them. You now have somebody who thinks they fell back to TCP and may say, oh, I've now got a reliable link that's still dropping the datagrams, which I think is probably fine because if you asked for datagrams and you said this should be unreliable, the fact that we gave you something unreliable shouldn't upset you that much. Uh, but it's worth noting that the result of falling back to H2 does not necessarily change the entirety of whether or not it's unreliable, it changes one piece of it over one link between two particular hops on what may be a several hop path to your ultimate destination. And then the other question is, if we're gonna make it a new frame or do something that's a little bit more disruptive to H2 rather than mapping on top of H2, uh, a lot of the conversations that we're having about this 
seem like they would be interesting in a more general context, would we use any of this elsewhere over HTTP2? Because that would potentially lead us towards a destination where uh, we are more interested in making more fundamental changes to the protocol versus defining a mapping on top of it. Next slide, please. Finally, one thing that came up a little bit earlier uh, and I thought I'd note here is we've made a decision that I think we're all pretty happy with right now that we don't want to have the underlying QUIC or H3 or H2 stream IDs be exposed to the client. But as Victor said earlier, right now there is kind of a stream ID space for each web transport session that's still in the document a little bit, but then there's discussion on GitHub about that's coming out or then going back in. Um, so the question was already raised and, and I just second raising that question of should we expose those stream IDs? And the, the biggest thing that I would note is we need to make sure that whatever we do there, having it be consistent across all the possible mappings of web transport onto different underlying protocols needs to really, really, really be the same there, which I think pretty much prohibits us from using any of the underlying protocols stream IDs directly. And I think that's a good thing. Next slide. That's it. For questions, please join the queue now. I saw Robin joined the queue and then left. Specific questions that you would like answers from the working group. Oh, Ian Sweat, um, I had a kind of a high level question. I, I think a lot of these questions that are being brought up are, are really good. Um, how many of them do we need to answer before we pick kind of a technical direction here? And and what are the most important ones in the uh, view of the participants and chairs? That is an excellent question. I, I have a brief note on the H2 document specifically, and then I'll hand it over to Bernard and David to answer the other half. Um, the first half of this presentation is a lot, and, and it kind of ties into the second half, is, is a lot of stuff that Victor has talked about and that we've just been talking about. And I think some of those we need to collectively describe, decide as a group where we want to go. A lot of the other ones are much more implementation detail of assuming we're already going in that direction. Just, you know, what do we need to make progress on the H2 document itself? And those I don't think we need to answer before we decide, for example, to adopt a particular direction, which I think is going to come up later uh, as Victor's talking about the different layers of what we could do. So I think the big question for today is very much what are the layerings that we want and the overall kind of destination we think we're getting to more than the specific nitty gritty of these things. But that said, I'll defer to, to David and Bernard for their thoughts. Well, uh, uh Victor has a presentation later uh, in the session which relates to the HTTP3 transport versus quick transport. And I think we'll refer to some of that uh, earlier. So that seems like a big one to me, but. Uh. David, do you have any thoughts? No, oh, I, I wouldn't necessarily. Um count on the chairs. I don't think we have authority on deciding like what are the important questions. That's definitely a matter of working group consensus. Um, but I agree that like we we have some of these questions that span the drafts and I think um, maybe we should uh, focus on those and you know potentially in collaboration with the W3C for those that directly impact the JavaScript API. Yeah. I think we may need to spend more time uh, than we have been maybe interim meetings or something may be needed. Yes, I agree. That makes sense. Um, all right. And then next in the queue, I have Simon Hicks. Who's requesting screen sharing, it looks like. 
<laughs> all the slots for the requested media are taken. Yes, you can't grant screen sharing while you're currently sharing. Oh, uh, right. Uh, I mean, did you mean to request a microphone? Uh, I'm going to decline the screen sharing request. And Simon, if you want to join with just the microphone, click th the button on the right, which is the one that has a microphone that allows you to join the queue. Going once. All right, should we move on to the next item, Bernard? Sure. Okay, Victor, you're back. Can you hear me? We can. All right, excellent. So I will first review the details of web transport over H3 and web transport over quick drafts. So those are the two drafts uh, that are also presented of specific transport. And then we will go into overview of like the question which transports we actually need. Next slide. So web transport over HTTP, uh, I've not updated the draft in any way. There might be some updates we will need to bring it in consistency with HTTP2 draft, but it's basically intends to do the same thing, but for, for HTTP3. Uh, there are, I've not updated it because I want to gather our general direction mostly before we proceed with getting to the nitty gritty. And I actually potentially hope we could merge those to drafts. Next slide. Uh, quick transport is a very, is the minimal version of web transport, which is we just take quick and we build the smallest protocol possible to satisfy all of the eight design requirements in the drafts. Uh, it uses a special ALPN value. It has its own dedicated URI scheme. Uh, it has uh, its own format for request headers, but not response headers. Uh, and uh, it provides exactly one quick connection per uh, transport object. Next slide. Uh, the quick transport URI scheme has a server name, which is sent as an SNI. It has a port number, which is the UDP port to which you connect. And it has a, a path and query, query web value, which are sent as a part of the handshake. And the handshake uh, is like a request header, which has two fields. One of them is the origin of the page to satisfy CRS requirements. Another is the path specified in the URI. Next slide. So the status of quick transport is that we implemented it in Chrome. It is currently available in Chrome stable as an origin trial. Uh, it will be available for approximately until November. Uh, which is when our origin trial will automatically expire and uh, it will stop working as is. Uh, it's, uh, we did some interop and I think uh, we interop with ourselves. We interop with AAO quick uh, and the Chrome 84 implements draft 27 and Chrome 85 and later implements draft 29 as well. And it supports version negotiation. Uh, so that something with that we hope to use to gain more developer feedback about what developers like and don't like about the API and quick transport as is. And uh, uh, hopefully this might assist us in the decisions that I'm going to discuss now. Uh, uh, so next slide. So now to the actual big question is that we have four drafts and we need to decide which of them we want to adopt and which of them we do not want to adopt at this point or possibly ever. Uh, this is a continuation of discussion we had at the previous meeting. We had since had some discussion on the mailing list, which I believe 
helped clarify a few points, but I don't think we still, we're still not at the point where we quite have consensus or even enough information. So I'm going to present the like updated, like points against one way or other way. Next slide. So the transport purpose so far are quick transport, uh, which is minimal quick based web transport implement uh, protocol, HTTP2 and HTTP free transports, which are protocol extensions to HTTP that allow a web transport session to exist inside an existing HTTP connection. And there is a hypothetical fallback transport, uh, which is uh, in, we didn't write, uh, I never wrote it, but like there was an idea of implementing something that's polyfillable in the web as it is today using WebSockets. Uh, and the question are which ones we want to adopt next slide. So uh, there are two important axes in which we compare, which is one trans some transports are quick based and some transports are TCP based. And we want to adopt at least one quick based and at least one TCP based. We want one quick base so we can get uh, unreliable datagrams, et cetera, in ideal case, and we want TCP-based fallback for situations when quick is blocked. Uh, and dedicated versus pooled, so quick transport and fallback transport uh, always have their dedicated quick or TCP connection. Uh, the pooled options, uh, I'm referring, to pooled is not the only distinction important there, but the important thing is that you can pool multiple transfers on one physical connection. Uh, next slide. And I guess the main dichotomy is whether we want quick transport, HTTP free transport, or whether we want to do both. And uh, here is an overview of like important aspects. Uh, there are quick transport of like besides connection, quick transport has a nice property that there is no HTTP dependency, which potentially simplifies things. So I'll get later to why this may or may not be the case. And here's an interesting list of target applications, uh, which are very speculative based on partially based on what I gathered from developers uh, with whom I talked and partially it is my intuition of what would be better applicable. Uh, so next slide. So what are the advantages of HTTP based transport like HTTP free transport and HTTP two transport? Well, the main one is that the way HTTP free and HTTP two transports are defined is that you can reuse them with an existing HTTP connection. That is to say that if you're connected to a website and you're requesting new HTTP free transports, the browser can just go into its socket pool, find that it's already connected to the transport, presumably because it fetched the top level frame page over same connection, and then you can just create a stream inside the transport. Uh, and uh, this is very convenient because it reduces the number of sockets in use. Uh, which means you can save on certain data structures and this makes this entire thing potentially more, more, more scalable. Uh, and one important thing is that while often you would want to have uh, one number of, so one thing about having multiple connections to the same host is that uh, the more tabs you open, if you create a connection per tab, you might at some point run into connection limits. And here, and if you do pulling all of the connection, all of the transport objects would go onto the same connection. So you would not, you would be subject to different limit, which could be potentially different. Uh, so other thing is that since you have the connection, you don't have to pay the connection establishment cost in terms of latency uh, and the, Final advantage is that since it's just an HTTP connection, the traffic, web transport traffic is identi looks identical 
from that standpoint, from the handshake standpoint to HTTP traffic. So an important thing to note here is that multiplexing is supported, and that means that the wire protocol allows you to put multiple transports on the same connection or share a connection between HTTP traffic and web transport traffic, but this is not necessarily a requirement. There are some cases in which you might want to have a dedicated connection, and there's nothing in the wire protocol itself as specified in the drafts that would prevent you from doing that, i.e. opening a HTTP connection dedicated to a certain object. So this is actually, despite being a wire protocol concern, this is more of an API concern uh, from the, my perspective. Uh, so that's... Uh, uh, do we want to take questions as those slides go? Because then yeah, yeah, I think I think so. For this All right. One. Ben. Uh, hold on, I can't hear you. Yeah, have you you gotta turn I on audio? Microphone. Oh there we go. Now we hear you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so on slide forty four you have this implication, I guess, that uh, that the dedicated transports are essentially more appropriate for use cases with tighter performance requirements. At least that's that's the, the net effect I see on the left. A quick transport is faster, basically. Uh, so I would not say it faster. The reason they are put there is that because in those use cases, you would often want to do things like get detailed statistics on connection level things like our transmission, and sometimes even do things like custom condition control. And yeah. you can't do that really with a pooled connection. Also, so, the, the, some of those target applications are peer to peer, so you wouldn't have to run an HTTP3 server. That may be the other thing there. Uh, Yes, so, so yeah, basically, but the point I was trying to make when I said that there's are not inherent properties is that you can still do that with HTTP transfer. It's just you have a connection with HTTP framing, but you don't really use that framing besides the handshake. That is to say, once you are done the handshake and assuming that you have HTTP connection in some hypothetical dedicated mode, there is no difference between HTTP transport and quick transport outside of minor differences like prefixing and assuming that you're connected directly. That is one of the observations I want to make. So, uh, hi, I, Meet Echo kicked me out for some reason. Um, the, the, the claim I want to make here, well, so apart from, as, as you pointed out, um, if you want, if, if the performance of, of multiplexing is a problem, you can always just choose not to multiplex as a server deployer. But uh, also, if you do multiplex, then you have a single congestion control context that can view um, both the HTTP and web transport traffic. And so you can potentially down prioritize HTTP traffic in order to make space for very pressing real time web transport traffic, which is not something that you can do so easily if they're actually in separate quick contexts. That's an interesting point. I, I guess this goes back to the question of it's some, like there is an argument that if you put them on the same connection, you can do more meaningful prioritization. Uh, I do agree with that. Uh, other questions? You what know, will really happen? Just uh, pointing out it's not so clear. Cool. Then uh, next. Up is uh, Jonathan Lennox, and and you talk. By the way, please use the button to join the queue. Uh, that way, you, you're properly ordered. All right. uh, Jonathan, go ahead. Uh, am I am I live now? Okay, yeah, Jonathan Lennox. We hear you. Okay, we good. can hear you. 
I guess you don't, they don't, you don't hear me until I hear the beep, which is an important thing to note. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess my question um, also is, so for the HTTP transports, is it anticipated that like the whole, all the, the client would basically have to support, at least, the, at least the client would have to support the entire HTTP state machine in particular, you know, you can anticipate being 300 to a different location and things like that? Uh, yes, I'll talk about that on the next slide. Okay. Uh, Ted? I uh, just wanted to, to go back to what Ben was saying and to say, while I agree with them, I think I have the exact opposite reaction to slide 44. Uh, when I look at it and see the HTTP load balancing and transport uh, routing that can occur with HTTP, uh, there are definitely cases for quick transport where I don't want that for applications that are non-web related. And we, we've talked in other contexts about things like DNS over quick, where it has its own caching infrastructure and its own routing mechanisms that you would not want to have too much interference with HTTP, um, which has different views of the same general uh, set of capabilities. I, I don't want to run DNS over quick transport, but I do think it's instructive to look at things like that and say, if we actually want this to be used in contexts where it's somebody who needs this kind of transport and doesn't need uh, to share a context with the web, um, <clears throat> you, you definitely don't want to make them use HTTP if it's not the context that they're already in. And I think that argues for keeping quick transport in the list. Uh, it doesn't say anything about whether you also want HTTP3 HTTP3 transport in the list, but I think it argues pretty strongly for keeping quick transport in the list. Thanks. Uh, next slide. So another advantage of HTTP transfer and the reason I'm particularly enthusiastic about it is that we can use HTTP standard metadata format. And the reason uh, I am excited about it is because as we I've thought through quick transport and as we build up more and more of it, it's the more we spend time building it, the more it looks like HTTP. So like right now it is, uh, has request headers, but no response headers, which looks suspicious so like HTTP 09. Uh, at some point we might add response headers uh, and there are also headers which we need to add potentially, which would look a lot like HTTP. So the notable examples are the origin header, which we already have and we can't get CRS without that. Uh, another example is if we ever add load balancer support, uh, we would want to have uh, forwarded, aka also relatedly X forwarded for header, because this is really, this is the header that when you're behind a load balancer, it lets you know the IP address and identity of the actual requester as opposed to the proxy requester. Uh, that's an example of a header that a lot of people would want if they deploy web transport in the load balance settings. Another very pop, another feature that people often want, and I know that because I myself found myself in a situation with a certain non-HTTP protocol where I really needed that but did not have, is a location header and 301, 302 status codes, which allow you to redirect the URL from one to another, which is very practical for operational reasons. Uh, so, and besides that, there are lots of headers which uh, are deployment specific, but are used to do things like do request tracing and performance tracing. Uh, and those are also some things that people would want and people have already built up infrastructure, build out infrastructure for. So I assume that like a lot of those could be potentially ported to HTTP transport since uh, 
they allot any headers that does not make a specific assumption about the request and response body being a sequence of bytes can be pretty much ported to HTTP transport. Uh, there is a counterpoint to that, that there are headers that could not, and there are cases when there's assumptions that HTTP transport is in fact HTTP can be dangerous and confusing. Uh, and uh, this is something we've experienced with WebSockets when people assume that WebSockets behave like HTTP in cases when it did not behave like HTTP. So I guess to solve that problem, we would need to try to carefully analyze what are the assumptions people make and how we address them by either trying to make web transport more consistent with HTTP or by trying to, or by going the other way. Uh, next slide. So the most of the disadvantages of HTTP lie in complexity. And the first complexity is the implementation complexity. HTTP on one level is very simple uh, because it's just effectively you attach metadata to streams on both sides and you're pretty much done. And you don't need things like server push if you're implementing web transport only. But there are some complications with the fact that HTTP requires mandatory header compression. Uh, we There is a draft that I wrote for HTTP this working group, which would solve the problem by making that negotiable. So that's one barrier in terms of complexity that we can remove. Uh, and the other barrier is more of complexity barrier to the clients that everything that involves socket pools is uh, subject to just being much more difficult because socket pools are hard. Uh, the design complexity here is more interesting topic. So one of them is we have to define interaction with existing HTTP mechanisms and uh, what I mean by that is that there are headers which apply very clearly, like, for instance, this silly thing, like user agent header can be always sent as is. Uh, uh, similarly, client hints can be sent as is. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are headers like alt service, uh, which are more tricky because we would have to think very carefully about how we decide between HTTP3 and HTTP2. Uh, so in situation where you have quick transport, you can, and some TCP transport with base transport, you can solve the fallback problem by entirely offloading it to the application. That is to say that you can give a quick transport object which just fails when you don't have quick, and the application can choose to either only use that or use that but race it with TCP connection or use some other fancy scheme which they can fine tune as much as they want. Uh, with uh, HTTP transport that is not possible because the web application has no visibility into the current state of the socket pool uh, and also the current state of the L service mapping. So whatever we would have to define some semantics for how HTTP is so socket is selected and that is not trivial because there are questions like if we're using web transfers, we would probably always want to try quick and HTTP free because we might be talking to some server we've not talked before and it would make sense intuitively to assume that if we're using web transport, it probably speaks quick. Uh, on the other hand, what if we have a, a existing socket and that socket is HTTP2 and the reason it's HTTP2 is we never got L service mapping. So HTTP3 is there, but it uh, might be there, but it doesn't, we don't know. 
And do we use that HTTP2 connection immediately or do we try attempt HTTP3 connection and what happens? And there are lots of questions like that to which I currently do not have answers. The other questions to which I do not have answer is how do we make sure that we, in a situation when we pull multiple transport over the same quick connection, how do we avoid a DOS attack by one transport just opening streams because there has to, because usually connections have a, a flow control on streams. And this means not only that the creation of streams is flow control, but often implementation will have some max stream limit for the entire connection. It will not let you go below, be, beyond that limit. And if one transport just exceeds that limit, what, what happens? Uh, so that's other question we would have to solve and we don't have to solve it in dedicated case because it's a quick flow control maps one-to-one. -one. And then there are also things like stats, et cetera, which are much easier to define with dedicated connection. But of course, as I said, we could make a dedicated HTTP free variant and just let applications select what they want. Uh, next slide. So in terms of implementation experience, I think we have some positive experience with both. Quick Transport is implemented in Chrome. There are, I've heard, I'm familiar with at least four instances of, of relatively independent implementations of a server in it, and it's as easy as it sounds. Uh, it works. HTTP transport, I'm not sure about the very current drafts. The previous versions were definitely implemented at Facebook and Apple. So that presumably also works. Uh, I don't see any reason. So as I said, there is much more complexity, especially in terms of socket pulls. Uh, next slide. So there is a question of how, which of those transports are mapped better suited to which use cases. And as far as I am concerned, I believe that all of the use cases can be to some extent satisfied with either option because the reason those use cases are appealing uh, for, uh, web transport is appealing for those use cases is not because of any specific reason inherent to those transports, but for most of them, the most appealing part is obviously support for partially reliable streams, independent streams and unreliable datagrams is what is the fundamental block of any web transport implementation of, I'm sorry, any web transport protocol, both quick transport and HTTP transport. Now, of course, there are properties which for some use cases would makes this more appealing. For example, as I said before, because HTTP has, uh, uh, it is the problem of load balancing HTTP and using HTTP reverse proxies. It's very well understood. So you, we know for facts that you can build up a very scalable uh, HTTP load balancer and we've worked through the proxying. Uh, so this means that any case which relies on having a large server farm, for instance, there are cases like push notifications, uh, those cases will find this feature particularly appealing. On the other case, there are cases where the complexity really matters. Uh, one interesting case is I've talked to people who do game development and they said that they often have to ship their implementation from scratch because they write code for unusual platforms with unusual tool chains where they might not necessarily use something that's existing open source. So for them, it would, and if they are trying to make like their networking stack unified, that is same from the web and same from the uh, native platform codes, they, they would, much rather opt for something like quick transport. And in general, I believe complexity is important uh, because from what I've heard, complexity was one of the most biggest barriers to uh, 
adoption of RTC data channel in client server cases. Uh, so that's my view on like which use cases are better satisfied by which transports. And the brief answer is there are some indications one way or other way, but ultimately I do not believe this is like as important as it sounds because fundamentally what you need is you need to have datagrams and, and partially reliable streams. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are some questions. So the drafts by themselves, they define protocols, but there are some semantics that's attached to the protocols, which are not part of the protocol. And in HTTP, as this is a lot what I what we would call fetch level concerns that is usually there somewhere either in what we fetch spec or in many cases are actually completely undefined by standards. So the most important one is uh, what is the URI, URI scheme that represents the web transport resource and for quick transport is almost definitely quick transport. For HTTP transport, we could either define a new scheme or use a HTTP scheme uh, that would have some implications on how uh, it web transport interacts with the origin model. And then there are concerns like if, regardless of whether we go with quick transport or HTTP transport, do we do things like send cookies and uh, other things like HTTP off? And there, as I mentioned before, there is a big question of how this works with L service and socket pools. Uh, next slide. So like, as I said, we currently, from the discussions that happened in mailing lists so far, it looks like there are people who are either inclined to only ship HTTP or only ship quick. And I haven't heard that much enthusiasm for shipping both. That I have a, that's because previously I proposed shipping both and there were serious objections to adding more complexity for what perce was perceived to be insufficient reasons. Uh, but I still believe we are not quite at the point where we can come to this to conclusion, mostly because I want uh, a lot of people who chimed in so far have been uh, uh, people who are either, either browser vendors or vendors of major server software. But there is, in the case of web transport, one of the main target audiences smaller independent web developers. And I want to hear from them or even from bigger web developers who typically do not appear what they think about this. Uh, so uh, the current plan is I want to continue this discussion both, well, I don't think we have time for this meeting, but on the mailing list and potentially we could have an interim meeting dedicated to this topic if we don't come to any consensus on the mailing list. Uh, that's it for the slides. We have a couple of minutes for discussion of this. And hopefully we won't be cut off at the deadline. Do we have people in the queue? Uh, you talk on, uh, can you hear me? We can. So, um, so I didn't mention in the mailing disc this discussion, but uh, I'm not opposing to having both quick transport and HTTP three transport. really interested in folks who have opinions on like which protocols that we want to build because I think uh, answering or reaching consensus for this as a working group will help us uh, narrow that down and that way we can move forward start moving and making progress on these documents uh, Philip go ahead so uh, hi Philip Teasel uh, 
when seeing the presentation, I asked myself a diff study different question, but whether the transports are always sought end to end, or whether, for example, a load balancer or proxy might convert between different web transport implementations. So if you have an HTTP based transport with a load balancer that then is using a, a quick transport towards the backend system that is uh, actually processing the data. Uh, that is possible, though it's easy to do between HTTP3 and HTTP2, and actually quite possibly we might want to uh, do that, uh, like define that as default behavior. Uh, it is much less obvious between HTTP we say and quick because then we would have to define how we convert metadata and how that even looks like. Uh, because like if they have the same handshake metadata, then uh, there is a question of what's the benefit of having both. Go ahead. Eric Nigren, I, we can hear you. Eric Nigren, Akamai, I guess you, it would seem preferable to avoid having all four because then there's gonna be pressure for in some situations to implement all four. And it seems like it's gonna be easier to do, um, we have more flexibility to layer on things like various he um, header extension functionality and authentication and interactions with the web model if we go with the H2, H3 combination. Whereas if we go with the um, just native quick and native TCP side, then we're gonna have to um, respecify a new layer of a new layer of things like that. So it seems like just going with the H2, H3 side and then perhaps as Ben suggested in Jabber having a profile down version so people didn't have to implement the whole thing um, might be a preferable approach. Ben Schwartz. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to surface that idea that uh, I wonder how complicated it would be to implement the quick transport semantics. So one transport per quick connection and, and uh, you know, basically the, the very simple semantics in HTTP3 wire format. Um, uh, the answer is it should not be that hard. As I said, that's one of the motivations behind the draft to disable header compression because it should mm. look very much like that after you disable header compression. Because uh, in that, there, if we, sorry. Like, like there's like still, like there are still a lot of other questions we would have to address, but that's, I guess the main conclusion I came to after thinking about this. Yeah, I think we should, we should make it possible to participate as either endpoint without having to have a full HTTP3 implementation if all you need is web transport. Um, but it would be really nice if I can make, uh, I can write you know, this, this limited HTTP3 transport only implementation of a client or server and speak to a remote endpoint that actually is a full HTTP3 implementation uh, and have it, have it all just work. Ben and Ted, you're back. And we're gonna cut the mic line after Ted since we are over time. I, I'm not sure I'm worth having the, the last word on this, honestly, but I just wanted to, to highlight that I continue to think it's it's entirely possible for you to to create a, a profile for the client uh, that's relatively bare bones on the HTTP transport, but you can't be sure that it then goes into an environment that treats it any differently than a standard HTTP um, right. 
connection. And I think that's that's where I continue to believe that having it over uh, a quick transport is a valid choice. And whether people are willing to do that, given that it gives you two to do rather than one, I, I can't say. But for me personally, it's the ecosystem difference between the bear transport and the HTTP ecosystem that makes it valuable to uh, to consider separate transports. It's it's really different in the world where you're you're building on top of HTTP with all of the Fiddlebox and that that think they know about it, um, than if you're building on on a bare transport. And I think as we discuss this, we ought to keep in mind not just the the client and server manufacturers, but the the people who build um, load balancers and proxies. Because while they do a great job when this is connected to a web uh, application or a web uh, service, I'm not sure that it's the right thing to do when it's not. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Just uh, maybe a little bit of wrap up. Um, I think as a result of this meeting, we have a number of things which we need to focus on and probably will uh, initiate several discussions on the mailing list. Uh, and if they're not converging quickly, I think maybe an interim meeting may be in order. Any other ideas, David? Final statements? I think that makes sense. We'll take um, we'll take a lot of these questions to the list, and uh, we do encourage folks who are on here to follow the list and please answer there. I think it would be really nice to reach consensus on these before our next uh, session. And uh, as Ben was saying earlier, this might call for an interim meeting, so we'll we'll also discuss this on the list to see what folks' thoughts are. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I think this has concluded the session at ITF 108. That's all, folks. Thanks, everyone. And special thanks to our Jabber Scribe and Minute Takers.